I want to welcome our first speaker. Um, Tom Casimirs is here with us. He's going to be speaking to us today about neuroscience in the database, uh, which is fabulous. I've, I've heard lots of stories about people doing uh, non-geospatial things with Postgres over the years, and it's great to have someone uh, talking about it through us today. Um, I'd like to hand it over to you, Tom. Okay, just a second. I hope you can see my screen. Can do. Excellent. All right, let's get started. Hello, everyone. And welcome to the first talk of Post Day 2021. I'm going to talk about a smaller niche of the free software world where we use PostGIS to represent neurons and synapses to model brains in a 3D space. And this happens in a software called CADMATE, which is a collaborative web-based tool for online 2D and 3D image browsing for image annotation, for neural reconstruction, proofreading, and of course also network analysis for those neurons that are, live in this space. Uh, so there's a clear neuroscience focus, but it's got its, its other uses too, whenever you want to display large 3D image data in the web. Um, CatMate is free software and is used by different labs around the world, mainly with electron microscopy data, uh, on which I will speak in a second a little bit. And I hope I can provide an interesting view into a software world, which otherwise goes largely unnoticed maybe, but where free software is also of an important role. Um, my name is Tom Katzinius. I'm the main developer of CatMate. And after university, I worked three and a half years at Max Planck Institute for Cell Biology and Genetics in Dresden, where I started uh, being part of the CatMate developer community, after which uh, I moved to the US for six and a half years and worked at Howard Hughes Medical Institute's Geneva Research Campus to further develop CatMate uh, both in a lab setting and as part of their uh, scientific uh, computing department. And since last year, I'm back in Germany and where I founded my own software and database consultancy, Casmus GmbH. Before I talk about how we use PostGIS uh, in this field, I'd like to motivate uh, the context and the data a little bit so you know what we actually try to accomplish and represent with this. Then I start with a high level view on the software uh, that I'm developing, CatMate. Um, and the little cat icon you see there on the slides is CatMate's logo, it's called Skelly. And from this, high level view, I'll dive down deep into the database and discuss some of the data structures that we use to model neurons and uh, similar structures in the brain. Um, to spend then most part of the talk, uh, hopefully uh, discussing different types of queries that we can do on these data as well, uh, in particular with a focus on postures, of course. Um, so let's get started. Um, the subfield I'm working in of neuroscience is called connectomics. Um, they deal with the network uh, of all the neurons in the brain. So they are in, in the labs I work with have a strong interest in the structure and the development of the central nervous system, including the brain, the ventral nerve cord, and so on. And they have interest in function of specific neurons and neuron classes, and as well as the networks that they form ultimately to get an idea and better understand how they drive our behavior or the behavior of any organism. This being part of fundamental research, um, we work with uh, model organisms that are common in this field. For instance, uh, the fruit fly or particular type of fruit fly, the Drosophila melanogaster, as you can see on, a, on the slide there on the left image. And biologists are mainly interested in their brains, of course, since we understand that want to understand the brain a little bit, bit, bit better. So what happens is that they would dissect the brain of a fruit fly, which looks like the comic representation on the right-hand side, and go from something like this uh, to something like that, uh, to something like that, which is about seven meters of neurons in such a tiny brain of a fruit fly, um, reconstructed in this CatMate application by 20 labs uh, uh, with over 180 users, uh, totaling to six, more than 60 person years, and they go through the software and follow individual uh, neurons and mark them in the data and the software as well as mark synopsis and form a network network with this. And to get from a dissected fly brain to something like this, you would start out with imaging uh, the, the fly brain. And there are many different ways of doing this. Generally for us, it is important that we have really high resolution, meaning something like four nanometers per pixel, because we want to identify synapses in the data set. And you need to have a certain resolution to make this possible. And the most data sets that I work with in this context have been using a technology called serial section transmission electron microscopy. And while this sounds complicated, what it essentially means is that it 
that we cut up a sample into very thin slices. In the case of the fruit fly brain, uh, we would cut it into about 7,000 7, different individual slices, image them individually, and have a resolution of four nanometers per pixel on the plane, while each plane is about 40 nanometers thin. Um, this results, of course, in large amounts of data, which isn't even uh, easy uh, to handle sometimes. And the data has sometimes problems in itself, like you can easily lose uh, these tiny and uh, thin sections, of course, in the process, kind of faults and everything. And the software dealing with this have, of course, it has to have, obviously, an understanding of this. Um, to get you give you a better understanding of what the data sets look like in this context, um, here are some uh, numbers. The smaller data set is uh, starting with a around a terabyte, uh, which is a larval brain of a fruit, fruit fly. You see the resolution there. And for to provide some context for the GIST people, this means in terms of open street map tiles uh, at zoom 11, 18, which is a common uh, highest magnification, means about uh, an area in terms of storage size, like the Scandinavian countries. If we look at the data set, uh, the image data set underlying the seven meter example of the colorful introductory image, you're talking about 11 terabyte image data sets, which is about OSM tiles for North and South America. It's like a rough estimate to give you an idea, but there are also other imaging technologies uh, uh, like the third example, which have even higher resolution in some contexts. But as you can see, similar to the GIS world, we as well like to use tiles if appropriate. And in these, for this imaging technique, this is the case. And as you are probably well aware, um, moving these uh, data around and copying and things like that are highly impractical, of course, and you have to have some sort of online resource to access uh, this sort of data, especially if you want to annotate it in a collaborative fashion, which given the size is not really, is not really avoidable. Um, generally, uh, this approach, approach has, of course, many benefits, like having given access to this data to low cost and low power devices, but also possible downsides in the sense of that you have to maintain a server or pay someone to do this. Um, the software that we have been developing over the past 10 years and working with in this research context is called CapMate, like I mentioned initially. And this stands for Collaborative Annotation Toolkit for Massive Amounts of Image Data. And this is pretty much sums pretty much up what the software does apart from the fact that it also comes with a whole suite of uh, analysis tools for the resulting networks in this context, as well as uh, user and project permission management. Since, like I said, given the size of the data, we want to work collaboratively in a single space. And to not only uh, explain with words what I mean, uh, this is a, a screenshot of a common uh, environment of CADMATE, which uh, is, uh, like, you, like I mentioned initially, a web application. So this runs in the browser. And it comes with its own little tiling window manager and has many little tools that can, that can interconnect where you can shuffle data around, get different perspectives on the data. In this example, for instance, we see the grayscale imagery on the left, uh, which is one of those slices that I talked a couple of slides ago um, that have been created by this electron microscopy process. And biolo biologists would now go through this data and mark and follow individual neurons in there and mark synapses, connect individual neurons. And the magenta dots you see on the left-hand side in the screenshot are intersections um, of this image plane with those neurons. You can also see those neurons in 3D to the right, uh, the next panel in the, in the screenshot, where the neurons are colored in yellow and you see some synapses in cyan, as well as some uh, meshes that represent different brain compartments along with other tools. And I won't go much deeper in, uh, than that into the software itself. Uh, this is just to give you a high level view and an understanding what uh, we work with. Another common uh, uh, thing that people use, uh, do in the software is that they look for similarities between neurons. For instance, here we look uh, for similarities uh, between different brain halves, or we can also look between uh, simil uh, for similarities between neurons and point clouds, which have been created from light uh, microscopy data, for instance. And this is just to show you that there are many spatial data, uh, many spatial data in the software that we need to represent somewhere. And all these spatial data, like uh, the three D meshes, like the neurons themselves, which are often called skeletons in this context here as well, since they are sort of a skeletonized uh, version of a neuron, as well as synapses. And point clouds are all stored and backed by postgis in the database. And you might wonder if this has to be a manual process, reconstructing these neurons and going through uh, these data sets. And in fact, uh, you'd be right uh, to doubt that this has to be the case. Uh, there are also automated process, 
processes and ways and research to segment the whole data set at once. However, um, this also takes a lot of time to later on proofread uh, the segmentation, like in this example that we created in collaboration with Google, with Peter Lee and Viren Jane in 2020, where we segmented the adult fly brain uh, that we saw initially. And CatMate can talk to this type of data as well and import it into our world. A similar thing can be done with synapses, of course, like this work from Julia Buhmann and Larissa Heinrich, where they used machine learning to track down individual synaptic partners and synapse locations. But this is just to mention it on the side because we ultimately want to talk about postures and how we model things deep down in the database. So when we want to model neurons, um, we uh, first come to think about what, like how, they, how do they actually uh, look like, what is important for them like, from a very coarse high level. They seem like complex structures and have a lot of branching going on. But turns out we can represent them in our case in a rather simple form. Just have to be aware that neurons uh, form also networks. Like if I turn on synapses in this case, here we see already that even a handful of small neurons like those ones here in this, in this comic um, end up forming large networks really quickly. And this whole network of all the neurons is called the connectome. This is also why the subfield is called connectomics. And the graph that is produced, the called connectome, is typically, in this case at least, a uh, directed acyclic graph, or at least a directed graph in many cases. And this, of course, depends on how individual neurons are connected to each other, meaning depends on the synapses. In our case uh, of the fruit fly, this, these chemical synapses are directed. They have a postsynaptic part, a potentially multiple po a presynaptic part, and potentially multiple postsynaptic parts. So we just have to be aware of that. We want some flexibility also to also represent other networks. Now, looking at an individual neuron, we see something like this, where we have, of course, a spatial re representation of the neuron. It's morphology. We know that we want to mark for these type of cells a cell body, a soma, which in this case is shown in the top of the comic with a little uh, sphere. And we want to be able to traverse skeletons and find its different branching levels, which I shaded here in different darker uh, getting colors. So this, and, but in order to look also at branching levels and such, we don't need only the morphology, but we would also need the topology of neurons meaning we need to identify the soma, what are leaf nodes, what are branching nodes, and so on. And it turns out for the neurons that we want to model in this context, a tree structure works really well and allows us to, be, to express a sort of neuron easily in the database. And what we do, uh, the way we do this is the, following, uh, is the following. We have in our Postgres database, a simple table called tree node, which contains all the nodes making up all the neurons in our uh, project. And just as an example, uh, as you can see here, um, this uh, an entry of such a tree node table, so a single node of a neuron, has references its parent node. And if every node does this, we can form a tree. And you see already in the schema here that the parent ID can be null, meaning that the node that has no parent is by definition the root node. And in general, for this sort of raw data, we also keep even the location coordinates, the physical coordinates of a particular node as real uh, floating point column data types here. So there is no post just yet, but it will come into the picture in a second. Um, this is just to give you an idea of how these underlying data structures look like, to give you an idea how big these table can become in a manual reconstruction world, um, which for instance had as a result, the seven meter of neurons screenshot in the beginning this table has a size of maybe 60 to 70 million nodes. And if we look at the whole automatic segmentation of this whole brain, we are talking about 800 million to up to a billion nodes within this table. Uh, there are quite a few Postgres features that help us to manage this. And we're looking at partitioning, partitioning and things like this, but this shouldn't be the topic here today. Um, and just to give you an idea of what you can do with a simple data structure like this, I'm gonna uh, uh, show you some example queries, what you can do. Uh, before I then talk about postures, I got uh, postures. So I'm gonna uh, rush a little bit through this uh, to have enough time for, uh, at the end for postures as well. So of course you can get all the nodes of a particular skeleton. Like I said, skeleton uh, and neuron mean the same in this context here, along with the locations. We can only get a root node of a particular skeleton. 
we can query neighbor no nodes of uh, a, a particular node of interest. And this is just to give you an idea what we how we can work with the sort of data in the database. And we would look at neighbors uh, at look, getting all the children of the of a node as well as the parent node. And of course, we do things like uh, or can do things with data structures uh, like that, like recursively traversing a skeleton. This can be important, for instance, if we want to find disconnected fragments of a node of a skeleton that are disconnected from a root node. And an easy way to do this is use Postgres's recursive common table expressions, which have a starting condition, like in this case, the, the root node of a particular skeleton, and the recursive part, which then is executed in a breadth-first fashion um, to follow all the child node connections from the last set of parent nodes. And we use this here uh, to find all the nodes that are disconnected from this set, meaning they are part of a skeleton, but not in this connected set. Um, don't worry about the, too much about the details here. This is more like an example, like I said, of how we work with this data set. Ultimately, we are interested in graphs between those neurons, and they can get complicated quite quickly, quite quickly, like I said. And on a very small detailed level, what happens in the database, uh, or on a conceptual level first, is that we represent these synapses um, through certain hub nodes, which we call connectors, and individual nodes of these skeletons or neurons can connect to these hub nodes with a defined relation. And this way, we have a lot of flexibility to define uh, different types of synapses. And the most common one being the chemical synapse here, which has a presynaptic part and some postsynaptic parts. Um, for the sake of time, I won't go into detail how we represent this exactly in the database, but it's pretty straightforward, the representation that we use here. If you have more interest in the details, talk to me later or uh, rewatch the talk or uh, watch the, uh, check the slides that I post on later. Um, so we'll browse a little quickly through this. Of course, if we have this kind of graph relationship between neuron, different neurons, we can do different joins to get partners and do this subsequently to find paths and so on. Um, but uh, let's talk about how we actually use PostGIS, since ultimately this is the PostGIS day. Um, for us, um, PostGIS helps a lot to query a lot of these large tables quickly. Um, and the way we query these tables is usually with some form of a bounding box query. So the are bounding box queries on the uh, most important type of spatial query that we use. And if you remember initially when I showed a screenshot of, shot of CADMATE, we had this one panel as one tool that showed the electron microscopy grayscale image data in the background and then on top of it in Magenda individual neural nodes. And for this view, we of course need to find out uh, from the or get as a response from the database which uh, neurons intersect with this field of view, which is a bounding box query. And this is the one uh, query that is used most heavily, of course, since this is such a common view. Um, but we also don't want to inter do intersection queries with nodes only, but in fact, with the edges between individual nodes, because they don't; these nodes don't necessarily have to be on individual uh, slices. Um, so they can be really far apart. And to present this and query this in an efficient manner, we use postures to define for each Note the edge to its parent. And in the schema here, you see that we use have an edge column um, that, that uses the PostGIS geometry type line, line string Z to represent our three dimensional edge between a node and its parent. And you can see that in this table, we define a couple of indexes that uh, allow us fast queries of these intersection, bound, uh, intersection requests. And the first index you will notice, uh, or we'll first notice that all these indexes are GIST index in our case. And GIST stands for generic index structure. Um, it's a very flexible index type. And it breaks down the data into rectangles and sub rectangles. Um, has benefits like being self tuning, can handle variable density very well, and different uh, data point sizes also. Um, it's very practical, and we use it for different types of queries and um, for different type of types of queries we also use different indexes and the first one we define there is using PostGIS's default uh, the 2d uh, operator class that is defined for on every edge the index tree node edge 2d gist um, is an index that can only be queried uh, for 2d or only 
indexes to the 2D, the X and Y coordinates of our 3D coordinate, but it is useful in some contexts, as we will see, we have a 3D version of this, which turns out to be slower in some larger queries, but some more is really useful for smaller queries. And we have another interesting type of index of this type of data, which indexes the Z dimension that a, or the range of Z coordinates that a particular edge covers. And we will see an example of the use of those index in the indexes in a second. And I want to mention for the last one, it is important to understand your data well, in the sense that for, for us, we know, for instance, for this sliced up electron microscopy image data, it is common that people access this data slice wise. So we can take a one advantage of this and define index at this floating rate point uh, Z range index to uh, make this query faster for large fields of view. Um, like I said, bounding box queries are important, and it turns out that different bounding box shapes um, benefit from different indexes better. So it makes a difference if we request a full slice of our EM data with the neuron data um, from, from the database, where we have basically a really wide bounding box, which is rather thin. We request only a single slice at a time. Or if we have a really narrow cube-like bounding box where we, request, where we may be actively tracing or we are reviewing, reviewing something. And in that case, we have more like a cube-like bounding box. And we will see examples of both queries in a second. And bounding boxes we also use, for instance, to intersect neurons uh, with different uh, geometries like uh, brain compartment, compartments, which are represented as 3D meshes in the database. Um, so to look at some examples here, um, this is an example query that works well for us. If we re uh, request a large field of view, made, like I said, maybe a whole section of these intersecting neurons with one of those image slices or a larger part of it. And what we do is that we uh, get all the edges from the tree node edge table and we, uh, from within a certain project. And the first thing we do is we use and apply this floating point uh, range index where we check the bounding box uh, Z dimension or the area of the Z dimension it spans against this index for with all our uh, Z dimensions of the edges, which helps uh, trimming down the results at considerably in our case. Um, remember that in, uh, in situations like large um, automated uh, setups, we have something like 10 million nodes per section for which we have to compute intersections. So this helps a lot. And with this trim down set, we can then use the 2D uh, operator, the double embers end, to filter additionally to the already Z filter edges, the X and Y uh, as well. And you would think that might be enough to be returned to the front end. However, it turns out this contains a lot of false positives in our case because the uh, 2D operator, the double ampersand operator, does a bounding box interaction check. Um, and it can be that in our case, edges don't actually intersect themselves with the query bounding box, but only the bounding box. And to uh, reduce the number of false positives, we are um, adding yet another filter which, uh, in which we kind of split our bounding box uh, in half and, and only allow from this plane, the center plane. Uh, for the sake of time, I will leave it at this for this example and won't go into detail on why this helps us uh, uh, to reduce the number of false positives in, the uh, in a bounding box query. A similar structured query can be used to um, get nodes that are in a really narrow cube-like bounding box. For instance, like uh, if you're actively reconstructing these neurons in data set, it looks almost the same. However, in this for this, we can use the 3D index very well. We use the ND operator, the triple embers end, and let the data set or let Postgres and PostGIS uh, return all the matching pairs, the matching edges right away. And for small data, a small field of views, this works really well. It does not work really well for large field of views, um, where uh, the separate 2D queries seem to be much more performant. But again, this is only a bounding box interaction check. And that happens with the triple embers end operator here. So we again want to remove uh, the false positive rate in our result by doing the actual Euclidean distance check um, uh, with the individual edges here. 
and but doing this only on those edges that actually are valid candidates. And as a last example of uh, the use of postures in our context, uh, I choose to uh, show a small sort of hack or different way of how we use uh, uh, compute closest nodes in our uh, in our brain um, or brain we want to represent um, by reusing existing indexes and without requiring that we have to define new indexes that would only satisfy uh, the closest node problem for uh, individual nodes. Since we have already these indexes on those edges, what we can do in this case is that we can get all the 100 closest edges um, and assume that the closest node will be among them. Of course, this 100 edges limit had to be, has to be tuned for your data set. You have to you know your data well to make um, shortcuts like this. Um, however, for us, it really helps a lot to bring down query time for uh, queries like this without uh, adding, having the requirement of adding more indexes. And then the outer part of the, of the query would just look among those 100 closest edges what the closest point on them is exactly. Um, of course, there are more postures features in CapMate that I didn't get to talk about today. Um, we have, for instance, more spatial annotations, points of interest, bookmarks, et cetera. We store, like I mentioned before, 3D meshes in post, uh, postures format as TIN uh, meshes as well. And there's as other spatial metadata that we store uh, in CapMate too. So at this point, let me say thank you, Postures team, for making spatial data and the database much easier, even beyond just. And I'm sure I'm not the only one who uh, uses postures not only for mapping. Of course, CatMate isn't only uh, is not only developed by me, and there are other people involved who have in, uh, brought and helped with ideas, but also with code and use of CatMate. Um, for the sake of time, I won't thank, thank individuals here, uh, but just so that they are mentioned. And I am uh, I thank you for your time and your attention and interest in the talk and postures in general. I'm happy to answer any questions, should there be any, and feel, out, feel free to reach out to me uh, even after the talk if you have additional uh, interest to talk about this. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. That was, uh, that was a great talk, and it's fun to hear about how Postgres is being used outside the geospatial world. Um, we don't have time to do questions live, but hopefully you can hang around in the chat and, and folks sure, can I will. you with some questions there or in the Q&A uh, Q &A box in Zoom. 